Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, Acts 1, beginning at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Next few moments I want to talk about manifested prom power, and this is part two. Manifested promise, this is part two. I'm, I'm concerned as I look at the children of Israel at that time as I am about today, if one were to look closely at what is taking place there in biblical antiquity, one would see a mirror image of what's happening in the world today. In that time in biblical antiquity, the Jews or the Israelites were there in their homeland, but they were in bondage in their own land. They were in their homeland, they were in the promised land of God, but they weren't living a promised life. They didn't have what they thought they would have. Can I? attach it to the American dream. They didn't have white picket fence and a beautiful little house. They didn't have two-car garage. They, they didn't have what they thought they would have had. They, they're living in the promised land, but they're not living the promise. They're living in a land of milk and honey, but they just barely have milk and they rarely get honey. They're living in a promised land, but they don't have a promise to attach themselves to. They're living on a hope, but the hope has not been done in their lives. It seems like their hope has been like Langston Hughes poem, A Dream Deferred. They're living in a promised land, but they're under bondage. They're under bondage because they're there under Roman rule and supreme authority, and that Roman rule holds them down, keeps them in check. They're right there in the city of David, built by the hands of one of the greatest kings ever. They're right there by the temple that God gave them to worship in, but they don't even feel like worshiping. They don't. They, they, they've come to a place where it's hard to get themselves ready because, see, you see, they have three issues. Sociologically, they've got a problem because they're they're under oppression, they're being attacked, they're being hurt, bruised, scorned. They're going through so much sociologically because they have given up on their own faith and they've started the infighting among themselves. They're taking advantage and abusing one another and mistreating one another. You know, hurt people end up hurting people and they're hurting each other. They're, they're going through so much that they are abusers themselves. They're going through so much that they lose out on their own sense of faith. They don't even know how to call upon the name of God. They barely go to church. They barely worship God. They're living in a situation where they're in the promised land, but there's no promise of hope for them. But not only is it a sociological problem, it's a scriptural problem. They, they have a scriptural problem because, you see, they have holy writ. They have text. They have Bible verses. They have what is the Hebrew scriptures in front of them. But those scriptures now need interpretation, and they don't even know how to open up the book and interpret what God is saying. They have have no ability to look in here and define real promise and hope. They're trying to look and attach themselves to something, but they're just afraid. They don't know what to do. It's been 400 years since God had a real prophet here. They didn't know what to do, and they had had this experience with Jesus, this time of his moving ministry, and they're hopeful that this is about to be a change, but they're trying to attach what is happening in Jesus' life to Scripture. And I thought I would just whisper this in your ear. There are some times in your life when you're trying to attach Scripture to what you're going through. Is there something that I can see that will help me be able to say and put me on the road of triumph? Here they are. They are sociologically in a mess. They are scripturally in a mess, but then they are spiritually in a rut. They are in a spiritual rut. It has been as though God has abandoned them. They've 
feel as though there is no God. You know, I, there, there's a place in them that thinks that maybe God has forgotten us. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if we have some folks in here feel the same way. Maybe God has forgotten us. Maybe God has abandoned us. Because if God hadn't forgotten us, then why are we oppressed in our own land? If God hasn't forgotten us, then why hasn't God kept his promise to me that he made to me? If God has not forgotten us, why is it that when I walk down my own street, I got to be afraid of those who are supposed to protect me? If God has not forgotten us, why is it that everybody else has wealth and I have none? If God has not forgotten us, why is it that I always feel bruised, busted, and disgusted? If God has not forgotten us, why do I feel like I get the low end of the totem pole? That's how they felt. If God had not forgotten them, then why are they experiencing what they're experiencing at the same time? You see, they are sociologically and spiritually and scripturally in a mess. They can't get this thing together. I thought I would tell you that the similar issues, the mirror issue, is our own issue today. Sociologically, right now, this country is in a mess. Sociologically, there's a problem. Many of you probably don't know this, but yesterday a verdict was reached, and they gave the verdict on a Saturday, the Saturday before Memorial Day, and they did it intentionally because what they said is they wanted to create as little of disturbance as possible leading into the work week when money would be made, and you might stop commerce if anybody wanted to protest because, you see, money is greater than people. You have to know that. The only color real some folk care about is green. It's not black or white. It's green. Economics is everything. 1% of the people own 90% of the wealth. The rest of us are begging to get by on 10%. And ain't much left for the rest of us. They don't hear what. Listen, this world is a mess. It was weird to me that yesterday was the day they chose to announce it. Because yesterday was another big day. Not just their announcement, but another big day. I'm going to break this down for you in a minute. Yesterday marked the 81st anniversary since the killing by the police of Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde were, were, were thieves. They were robbers. They had robbed banks. They had been two years on the lamb, two years on the most wanted list. Folk wanted to get them. Bonnie and Clyde, yes, they were killers. They, matter of fact, it is said that, that they were so bad that at least nine officers were killed during their killing spree. Thirteen people definitely were killed more than likely. So when they laid an ambush for Bonnie and Clyde early in the morning there in Salas, Louisiana, when they laid them on May 23rd, 19 1934, they seized upon them and they riddled their car with 167 bullets. 167 shots were fired to take down Bonnie and Clyde. Have to know this, Bonnie and Clyde had weapons, they had armaments, they had all kinds of shotguns, and back then, you know, you get yourself a Tommy gun and you could lay somebody out. So they, they, were, they were some bad folk. I know we romanticized Bonnie and Clyde's movement, you know, Jay-Z can, can't nobody do it like him talking about him and his Bonnie and Clyde situation. Yeah, listen, I'm sorry over some of you old folk here. Listen, you have to know we romanticized Bonnie and Clyde, but, but this was a rough situation in American history. A lot of fear and trembling were going on. But when this, this case that came up the other day related to this situation, there, those people that got killed here, they were not a part of the Barrow Gang. They were not on a crime spree. This were two people who happened to be going down the street whose car gets pulled over, and when they, for whatever reason, try to get away, they're car backfires. Unfortunately, they try to go on a high-speed chase. You can't really get away. When they when they went running away from the police, high-speed chase, you know, it was so far you can go on a Pinto. Listen, I'm not saying that's what they were driving, but that's the equivalent. Listen, they try to get away in a high-speed chase. They chased them down two years ago. They chased them down there in Cleveland. They're Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams. I know you haven't heard their name. It don't come up like Ferguson. It doesn't come up like New York. It doesn't come up like, like Baltimore. No, but these folks two years ago got stopped. When they stopped them, the police unleashed a hail of bullets on them. 13 officers shot at them and they let off 137 shots to get two people. A hundred and just 30 shy of Bonnie and Clyde. Now, I told you how bad Bonnie and Clyde was. Listen, 
These folk, they don't even have, they didn't have nothing to charge them with. There was no gun. It was a backfire from the car. There was no return fire at any time. They shot them at them 137 times. I can't tell you how many times they hit because they missed more than they hit. Listen, they shot at them 137 times without one return bullet. When they looked in the car, their bloody bullet riddled bodies were there. And guess what? Couldn't even find a BB gun. Listen, we live in a world where the world has gone upside down, crazy. We live in a world where people don't care about life. We live in a world, well, you. Cleveland is a rough place right now. It is still in Cleveland where Tamar Rice, a 12-year-old black kid who was playing with himself, fooling around with a toy gun, was shot within two seconds of a police officer standing outside of his car, never even once tried to figure out what was in the poor boy's hand. Wasn't under any kind of threat himself. Here he is. But what made that even worse, they didn't even give the parents the boy's body back to bury it. They kept him out of the ground for months after he was killed on the day he was killed. They handcuffed his sister, left her face down on the ground, didn't even care about the fact that this was a grieving sister, just a little girl who was upset because her brother had just been killed. This world's in a sociological mess, but it, it ain't just that. We live in a country where the land of milk and honey, we live in the richest nation in the world. And right now, if you just go back and watch the latest PBS special, you will see that in America, senior citizens are going to bed every night hungry. In America, the richest country in the world, the country that throws away more food than we need, this place here would allow our oldest citizens to go to bed Veterans are going to bed hungry. Seniors are going to bed hungry. Little children are going to bed hungry. And yet, we throw out more food than most nations have. This world's in a mess. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. This world is in a mess. It's a hurting world. It's a difficult world. Not only that, tomorrow is National Mission Children's Day because in this country, over 400,000 children go missing every year. Now, gratefully, because of all of the new ways in which we have to communicate, many of them get taken and get back. But trust me when I tell you, what it tells you that 400,000 kids could become a missing is that there's a whole lot of warped individuals out here that are pedophiles and slavers and wicked and vile folk. This world is in a mess. Well, if that doesn't get you going sociologically, you have to understand this world's in a mess when it comes to scriptures because most people don't know what to do with the Bible. They don't read it, they don't study it, and the only time they use it when it's to their advantage to get what they want. They'll quote a scripture when they want to get a Christian to do what they want them to do, but they won't try to live by a scripture on any day of the week. This country is in a mess. The Bible is used more as a guide than it's ever been used before, and it's been misused as a guide more than it ever has been before. People interpret scripture based on their own personal needs, and nobody wants to know the truth because you should shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and not enough people really want to be free but then this world is spiritually in a mess just like those children of Israel there's a whole new wave of folk right now that are calling themselves spiritual but don't know God they're calling themselves spiritual but they don't know God they they they, they have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof. Spiritually, they've been corrupted. They don't know what it's like to worship the true and living God. And so somebody want to ask me, what does Pentecost mean today? I want to tell you, this world needs a Pentecostal experience now just like they did in biblical antiquity. We need a fresh revival. We need the Holy Ghost to move. Well, come on here. We need to turn the world upside down. We need to get a Pentecostal movement going. I'm not talking about a denomination nor a particular church. I'm talking about an upheaval of all that is darkness, all that is wicked, all that is evil, all that is sinful. And I'm talking about bringing in the Holy Ghost to change the way we talk, to change the way we walk, to change how we care about one another 
Father, we need a fresh enlightenment. We need a brand new awakening. We need the Holy Ghost to be released. Oh, I'm sick and tired of folk talking about it. We need to be about it. I tell you right now, what God did at Pentecost in releasing unto them the gift of the Holy Ghost was to turn the situation upside down. Look at somebody, tell, tell, tell neighbor, let God turn your situation upside down. See, you'll move from fear to faith when the Holy Ghost comes in. You'll get up and you'll start speaking in a new tongue when the Holy Ghost come in. You'll have friends that you never had before when the Holy Ghost come in. You'll start talking to folk you didn't talk to when the Holy Ghost come in. You'll be loving folk you couldn't have loved before when the Holy Ghost comes in. You'll drop the spirit of hatred when the Holy Ghost comes in. You'll love people whether they're black or white, Jew or Gentile, when the Holy Ghost comes in. We need a revival! Well, well, there's some things this text can teach us. There's some things this text can teach us, and, and, and there are just three, I just want to, for a moment, just three things that the text teaches us that we need to know. And the first thing of which is this. The text teaches us that manifested promises relieve meantime experiences. Manifested promises relieve meantime experiences. Let me help you here. What, what you have here is, that God had made a promise to the children of Israel, just like he's made to you. And when it came to pass, all of that they had been through, all of a sudden was wiped away. Because see, you can't look at just what you're going through. You've got to look at where you're going to. Listen, 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 listen. I know, I know, I know somebody in here right now, you are trying to tell God that you got to have it right now. You got to do it today. You want to hurry God. God, let me tell you something. Your emergency is not God's ex exigency. You didn't, listen, you have to know this, that there are some things that are going to take time for God to bring them to pass in your life. But what you've got to get to the place is to realize that God is going to do what God said and it's going to happen and when well when we have here you know what the meantime is the meantime is what happens in between time between the time of the promise and the end result and what's wrong with some of us is if we don't get the end result quick enough we give up on the promise but we can't give up on the promise just because we didn't get the end result quick enough what we got to know is there's some stuff I got to go through in order to get where I'm going to and I know that when I get to my promise I'll be relieved of everything oh y'all ain't getting you know what's wrong with us? Some of us can't celebrate what God's doing in your life right now. You can't celebrate the one day of sobriety looking back trying to get years of sobriety. You can't celebrate the one day of holiness looking back trying to put years of holiness. You've got to get to the place to honor God where you are right now and to begin to realize that when it's all over, I'm going to get the blessing God has for me. It's coming to pass. I know I'm in the midst of something right now, but it's coming to pass. Okay, okay, you, you didn't get that. He, he, said, he says, and being similar together, verse 4 says, he said, said to them, Commander, don't you dare depart Jerusalem, but wait for the promise which the Father said. He says, for John truly baptized you with water, but I'm going to show sure enough baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. Some things are worth waiting for. Let me tell you something. Have you ever tried to eat a cake that wasn't fully baked? It's just dope. All the ingredients could be right. Everything that needs to be in there could be there. But if you get it out too soon, everything there just tastes gushy, ooey. It does nasty. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I'm saying. If you take it out too soon, let me tell you something. Some stuff has to go through the fire and through the heat in order to get to the right temperature, in order to create the right blessing for your life. Don't you worry about what you have to go through. God is going to... 
I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Let me, let me help you. Let me help. Somebody in here, you working on God. You said, God, I need you to work it out. God, please. God, please. I need, I need this kind of job. Lord, I can't stand it. I'm working now, but it's not enough money. I can't handle it. I'm going to get out of here. I'm quitting my job. Let me tell you, the devil is a lie. If God opened up that door, if you stay there and stay faithful, you'll create a track record that'll open up the next door. Don't get excited. Don't get worried that it ain't what you want it to be right now. Every day, every day, God's work. Well, wait a minute. Okay, okay, okay. I did this this morning, Deacon Wilson. There's a few people in here. Anybody in here who ever had like hip surgery, knee surgery, anything like anybody have knee, knee, hip, leg? Okay, Th thank you very much. I got a few folk in here, Deacon Wilson and, and, and Brother Ricky was here this morning. I got some other folk besides y'all that, that can testify that when you have the surgery done, Deacon Wilson had a knee done and his picture's all over New London now. Listen. They, They've got videos of him now online playing golf, showing him, showing him making that pro swing there, you know. Listen, you, you know what I'm talking about. But I want to tell you this. The day after the surgery, the knee still hurt. You don't hear what I said. The day after the surgery, Brother Ricky's hip still hurt. Y'all missed that right there. The day after, after it been cut, after it been taken care of, after the damage had come out, it was still hurting. What you have to know is this, that you've got to realize that I may have to go through a path on my way to my healing, and just because it still hurts, right now doesn't mean I'm not being healed. I'm not being delivered. I'm not being set free. God has a way. Look at somebody, tell them in the meantime, go ahead and praise the Lord. Tell them now in the meantime, in the meantime, go ahead and praise the Lord. No, y'all didn't do it like you Tell them I got a meantime praise. I got a meantime praise. I got a meantime praise. I've got a meantime praise. I, I, I know. Let me tell you something. Don't you fool yourself. The Lord knows how much you can bear. The Lord knows how much you can bear. And he's already worked it out. High five somebody, tell him he's already worked it out. He's already worked it out. Wait a minute, what you mean, Reverend? Well, I mean like this. Listen, if you're in the interval between the promise and the fulfillment, what you've got to do is to recognize that the fulfillment will come, so you go ahead and praise him on the promise because you know the fulfillment will come because his credit is good. That's why you can cry and shout at the same time. Look at somebody, tell them, I've done it. You can cry and shout at the same time. Someone said, why, Reverend? Because weeping may endure for a night. But joy, hey, 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 coming in the morning. I may be in the midst of my midnight situation, but I know for sure the morning will come. Okay, okay, y'all ain't get that. What, what I need to do, okay, 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 let me hear. Number two, number two, number two, y'all, y'all, I'm trying to move. Number two. You, you know what, you know what, I thought I would share this with you. That while they were waiting on the Holy Ghost to come, they were fellowshipping, they were walking in faith, they were doing great things in God. And guess what? They were continuing the business of the church. Okay, we need to put another person in place. We done lost Judas. Let's get another person in this spot. Let's get up back to the upper room. Let's get prayer going. We need to make sure we got something to eat. Let's go before God and pray. Y'all don't hear what I'm talking about. While you are waiting on God to do the next thing in your life, you need to keep on moving in the meantime towards what God's about to do. Don't just sit around having a pity party. Get on and begin to do what God told you to do. 
Don't you worry. He knows how to bless you. Okay, okay, okay. Number two, number two, number two. Manifested promises require management of expectations. Management, well, wait a minute, hold on. Manifested promises require management of expectations. What do you mean, Ralph? Well, you know what the first thing they said? Now, Lord, this all sounds real good, but we've been catching the opposite of heaven. God, if there was ever an antithesis of heaven, this is my experience now. I'm going through some stuff. So, so question number one for me, just in case nobody else want to ask you, God, is this the time now when you restore the kingdom? Is this the time now when we about to take control? Is this the time now when we about to rise up in this situation? Is this the time now that we about to turn this out? Listen, and what God responds to him, Jesus says to him, he says, look, I know you're tired. I know you're ready for the blessing to come, but you have to know restoration plans are in the plans of God. He said, and it's not your duty to know the times or the seasons that God's getting ready to work. What is your duty is to know that God is working. Okay, y'all, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. I wish I could tell you when God was gonna be finished blessing you. Okay, let me do this. I know some folk in here who have uh, had shoulder surgery lately. They've had rotator cuffs fixed. Okay, now I I know some who've had a rotator cuff fix who were out for long periods of time trying to get their shoulder moved back, get it going again. I know some, like my dear brother Deacon Glenn, who had a shoulder repair, who I see him moving his arm real good. He's going to therapy and all the rest. And somebody said, well, well, Reverend, how is it that somebody has a quicker recovery than somebody else? Is it just miraculous? Look at somebody now, some no. You know why? The longer it takes is relative to the damage that was done. You, you didn't get that. The more damage done, it may take a little longer for the healing, but it doesn't mean it's not healing, and it doesn't mean that the process is not working, and that God's not taking care of it, or God's not fixing it. So manage your expectations. You can't go a whole lifetime messing up and expect God to fix you up overnight. It takes a moment, but I promise you, God knows how to work it out. Let me tell you something. You've got to know God's still working it. Is there anybody in here that God has ever done something for you that you thought would never happen, and then all of a sudden you looked around and said, I can't believe God did it. I don't even know when God did it. I don't know how God fixed it up. I don't know what God did, but it, oh, you, I wish I had a witness right there. I don't know what God is doing, but I know God is up to something right now. God is up to something right now. Look here, look here. I just need, I need, I need two or three people. Just two or three, just two or three people. See, because somebody here don't know what I'm talking about. But someone else in here, you know, you know, you know, you know. That they, they thought it was over for you. They thought you were going down for the count. Matter of fact, they had already counted you out. They had already told folk you'd never make it. They had already told folk you weren't worth anything. They had already told folk you will never amount to anything. They said already that you're going to be dead by now. They had already cursed your life and said they'll be dead already. They had no idea. They said you'd never go to school. You'd never be educated. You'd never do anything. But the devil is a liar. 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 
The devil is a liar. Look at somebody now and just tell him, won't he do it, won't he do it, won't he do it? Won't he do it, won't he do it, won't he do it? Won't he do it, won't he do it, won't he do it? Out of all sake. Won't he do it? Look, 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 if half the folk could see you now that thought you'd already be dead, they'd be in shock thinking they're looking at a ghost. But what they don't know is they're looking at what the Holy Ghost can do. When you turn your life over to God, God will keep you. All right, I got, I got to close. I'm, I'm almost done. I'm going. I promise you, I'm going to my seat. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to my seat. I got all that. Glory to God. Listen. Listen, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to my seat. I'm going to my seat. L last one. Manifested promises release miraculous empowerment. Manifested promises release miraculous empowerment. Well, let me see. I got, I'm about to come up out of this. Let me see. Manifested promises release miraculous empowerment. What do you mean, Rev? Well, the Bible says that because God had made a promise, that God had to give them an empowerment so that the promise could come to pass. The Bible says that God had made a promise. And because uh, God had made it uh, the promise of God, uh, then God had uh, to bring it to pass. And, uh, what God said uh, is to go uh, to the upper room uh, and uh, there in the upper room uh, the Holy Ghost uh, met them there. They had been there for many days uh, but thanks be to God uh, when God thought uh, that it was time uh, the Holy Ghost uh, came in uh, like a rushing mighty wind uh, yellow and the Bible says uh, that it filled uh, the house uh, where they were sitting uh, and uh, God said uh, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Uh, that's what he told his prophet uh, upon all flesh. Uh, and your sons and daughters uh, would prophesy. Uh, on that day, uh, God poured out uh, his Holy Ghost uh, on everybody. Uh, he poured it out uh, on men and women. Uh, don't tell me uh, that a woman can't preach. Uh, don't tell me uh, that a woman can't minister uh, because when God uh, poured out his spirit uh, everybody uh, got touched by the Holy Ghost uh, have I got a witness uh, thank you Lord uh, for the power of the Holy Ghost uh, the Bible says uh, they started speaking uh, in a brand new tongue uh, they started speaking uh, with Pentecostal tongues of fire, uh, took somebody by the hand, uh, said, neighbor, uh, the Holy Ghost uh, ought to change your speech. Uh, the Holy Ghost uh, ought to change your walk. Uh, the Holy Ghost uh, ought to change your talk. Uh, I, I can't help myself. Uh, when I received the Holy Ghost, uh, I started speaking in tongues. Something came over me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. Excuse me now, you may not know about this, but the Holy Ghost 
will make you move. The Holy Ghost will take your tongue over. The Holy Ghost will make you shout.